Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the third lecture of the MS Vishweshwarya and Okakura Tenshin lecture series. Uh, this uh, lecture series is being organized by Japanese Studies India and uh, Japan Foundation New Delhi. Uh, as you know, the series uh, already had two lectures and Professor Bridge Tankha uh, is curating the lecture series. And I am uh, Tariq Sheikh, I teach at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad, and I am coordinating the lecture series. And um, uh, we are uh, organizing this lecture series as part of the events of uh, Japanese Studies India, which is a, a group of uh, Japanese studies scholars uh, of India. Uh, we, are, uh, we have a mailing list, uh, which we use to share as much information as we can about conferences about scholarships, fellowships, jobs, and also uh, new publications. So uh, if you uh, want to join the, the mailing list, uh, I will share the link of uh, the mail of the website that we have of Japanese Studies India. You can then uh, go to the website and you will find their instructions about how to join the mailing list. Uh, we also maintain a database of Japanese Studies scholars on the website and a few other resources. Uh, we are also uploading all the recordings of these uh, lectures uh, into, uh, to the website. So if you missed the uh, previous two lectures, you can go to the website and watch them, uh, watch the videos there. So uh, uh, after this uh, lecture, we are also, uh, in fact, before the lecture, uh, in a few minutes, I will share a Google form with you. And we use that to uh, gather feedback from all those who have joined the meeting. And we want to know how you felt about uh, the lecture and if you have any suggestions for future lectures. Uh, so this is a request from both Japanese Studies India yeah. and from Japan Foundation New Delhi uh, to please uh, fill up the feedback forms. It's a very short one and uh, uh, send, submit it just after, after the lecture. Uh, so the chair uh, for today's uh, talk is uh, Professor Bridge Tanka. Uh, I think for most of us, we don't. There's, there's no introduction is required for Professor Bridge Tanka, but uh, he retired uh, as professor of modern Japan Japanese history uh, from the University of Delhi, Department of East Asian Studies, and uh, he was a visiting fellow at uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies non uh, just a uh, couple of years ago, last till last year. And uh, I will hand over uh, the uh, the virtual mic to Professor Tanka to uh, conduct the proceedings of today's talk. Professor Tanka. Ah, thank you, Tarik, and uh, thank you, uh, Miyuki and Partha, for being here today. And to all of you who've joined, uh, welcome, a warm welcome to all. Uh, just a few words. I don't want to stand uh, between the speaker. Uh, because very distinguished speakers today. So uh, I'll just be very brief. Uh, my idea in organizing this series of uh, talks on its history and culture was really to, at many levels, one level was to open the dialogue between Indian scholars working on Japan and those outside, uh, despite, and or maybe because of COVID and technology, it's to invite people from across the globe the only thing that today stands between us is really time difference. In uh, you know, some places are inaccessible because of the uh, time difference. But really, it's made it much easier uh, for to get people. And uh, and I thought this was a good way to open up the discussion both within the country and at least present uh, what work we are doing here to outside. That was one, and I think it also helps particularly students and researchers to think of new places, uh, new areas and subjects to explore. I also wanted to bring in people who don't work on Japan, uh, particularly to broaden the conversation, because I, I really think uh, interdisciplinary approaches are obviously much encouraged these days, but I think we really need to break out of the national frameworks. We need to break out of the continental frameworks equally. I think there are many other ways of doing world history uh, where you, there are all sorts of connections. And I think particularly today's topic really points to some things which are often ignored. Uh, we look at Japanese history really in terms of the West, uh, surprisingly even uh, the US, despite the fact that both were modernizing roughly the same time. Uh, but 
Japan and its connections with uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, West Asia are very important, uh, whether you look in art history or political history. Egypt was a key uh, subject of study for the Japanese to learn how to break out of the unequal treaty relations. So I think uh, today's talk, uh, looking at Japan and uh, the Ottoman Empire and the ways they presented themselves to the West through exhibitions, uh, opens up a huge area of uh, interaction and uh, as far as I see it, Japan plays a key role within the East Asian region in disseminating knowledge. The Ottoman influences come right up to Kabul and Afghanistan uh, in many areas in West Asia. So, and all of us, India, Japan, the Ottomans, were facing roughly similar problems of translating Western structures of knowledge, classificatory systems, and trying to uh, sometimes reshape our own uh, existing ideas into this framework, doing violence at times and at other times opening up vistas. So, you know, today I presume we'll look at Kenchiku architecture. How did the Japanese define it? How did uh, uh, the Ottomans do it? I, I'm sure people working in India would know the name Ram Raz who was one of the early, uh, well, a translator who translated a book on Indian architecture and, you know, Hindu architecture, sort of ignoring the Indo-Islamic uh, mixtures and politics that were existed. Anyway, with these few words, let me introduce uh, Professor Miyuki Aoki Girdali. Uh, Girdali. 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 Ah, Girdali. <laughs> so is an art, she's an art historian teaching at Istanbul Technical University. And uh, she's not only a scholar, a recognized scholar, her works have been critically acclaimed, but also she's done uh, remarkable exhibitions on the Crescent and the Sun, on Japanese in Istanbul, uh, Japanese wind in the Ottoman palaces, and so on. Uh, you can read more about it in the uh, little uh, in the poster. Uh, and we have with us a very distinguished uh, scholar, Partha Mitter, to be a discussant. He is uh, currently Emeritus Professor of Art History at the University of Sussex and Adjunct Research Professor at Carleton University, Ontario, Canada. He's uh, been in uh, every other every place that you can think of in uh, Oxford, in uh, Getty visit, visiting Professor at Bogazici University, the Institute of Advanced Studies, Princeton, uh, Getty Research Institute and the Clark Art Institute at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And he was also in, invited to set up the School of Arts and Aesthetics at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, his books have been foundational for uh, study of Indian art and its reception in, uh, in uh, Europe. We have another uh, uh, discussant, uh, uh, Professor Muriel Haladik, but unfortunately she's not with us at the moment, but I hope she'll join us. She's a, a curator and architect and holds a, and teaches aesthetic theory in Aachen, uh, Germany. She works in Germany, France, and Japan, and she's worked in, uh, she's a specialist of uh, gardens and aesthetics, and she's uh, written on the art of building a tea house, excursions in Japanese aesthetics. So I do hope she joins with us, but without further ado, let me ask uh, Professor Girardelli to begin her talk on art histories from the margins. Usul u Mimari e Usmani and the Histoire de l'Art du Japon, perspectives from the Ottoman Empire and Meiji Japan. Yuki, the floor is yours for the yes. next. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction and thank you for uh, inviting me, uh, I am very honored to have uh, such a distinguished chair and the discussant. I'm uh, very pleased to see you on screen also. Uh, let me share my uh, presentation. Uh, entire screen. I'd like to start my presentation. Do you see whole uh, full screen presentation now? Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. Sir. So let me start. Yes. Uh, this was the image that uh, distributed as a, in my poster, uh, depicting the uh, state 
the Jap Japanese section of the 1873 Vienna exhibition. But my, my cover was, uh, I'm sorry, I did something strange. strange. Okay. Uh, my cover was going to be like this uh, in order to sh show the contrast between the Ottoman Empire and Japan uh, in the same exhibition in Vienna in 1870. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Aoki, if you can just click on Hihyoji uh, below. Ah, yes, uh, yes, this is. Thank you. Okay. So I, I, should I? Yeah. It, yeah, it it's fine okay. Yes. okay, thank you. So uh, when we uh, think about the today's topic, what can I offer for this lecture uh, dedicated to Okakura Tenshin? Uh, of course, with um, Bridge Tanka, uh, Professor Bridge Tanka, uh, we worked on Ito Chuta in the same book. So, uh, connect, connection between Okakura and Ito, of course, this book, uh, the first Japanese history of art uh, written in 1900, uh, came up to my mind. And also, uh, I decided to make comparison between uh, the same kind of book published for the occasion of Vienna exhibition in 1873, Usurumi Mari Osmani. So today's talk was uh, about these two books. And uh, actually, I have some publications on these topics. Uh, first was 2009, uh, presented, a paper presented in a uh, conference. And then, uh, I'm sorry, it is only in Japanese. Uh, there are two books on universal exhibitions published in Japan. Uh, I made uh, I, I made contribution on the Ottoman uh, presentation in the uh, universal exhibitions uh, published in 2015 and 2020, uh, just last year issued. So today's talk will be based on these publications. Uh, let me show you the outline of today's talk uh, with the, after the introduction on two books on art history, universal exhibitions and art history writing. And uh, I will focus on six, uh, five topics uh, about time lag and authors and translation letters, uh, chronology and narratives, and uh, the difference of art and architecture, uh, and at the last, Occidentalism, Orientalism, and the European classical tradition in two books. And as a conclusion, I, I am going to mention about uh, audiences and impact. So let me start uh, these two books. Uh, first of all, I'd like to compare the historical timeline between two countries. Uh, actually, Japan and the Ottoman Empire had time lags of approximately 30 years. The modernization started in with the Tanzimat re reform in the Ottoman Empire in 1839, whereas Japan was uh, 1868. And uh, when we look at the uh, promulgation of a uh, constitution, it's uh, like two, 25 years time lags uh, between two countries and also uh, the juridic juridical um, structure for the cultural property. The first law was issued in the Ottoman Empire 1874, whereas Japan was 186, uh, 1897. So uh, we understand this, uh, there is a, these time lags. So about two books we said uh, there are also time lags of approximately 25 years. Uh, one is 1873 and nine, the other is 1900. And uh, among these 25 years, uh, there are a lot of development uh, in 
uh, technologies and cultural notions, uh, etc. So uh, these two books ref ref reflect also those differences. So uh, I, I think it is better to uh, just have a review of uh, development of universal exhibitions from the beginning to the 1900s, uh, because the uh, situation of two countries uh, differs. For example, uh, the Ottoman Empire participated in uh, universal exhibition from the beginning uh, in 1851. And 1855 Paris exhibition, the next one, uh, for the first time, uh, the category of fine arts and architecture was created. And uh, for us, it is important that to know that uh, in the category of architecture, there were only 12 countries who participated. And the Ottoman Empire was one of them, the others being only uh, Western countries. So we can understand that the Ottoman Empire was the only uh, non-Western country who participated in the architecture section. And uh, of course, there was also the fine arts section uh, the Ottoman Empire also exhibited. The, for the architecture, only one representative uh, participated, Pascal uh, Artim Bilecikci, uh, who studied in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Uh, so in this sense, uh, Bilecikci presented uh, in the architectural language of the West. And uh, 1862, Japan, Japan's participation uh, came later, but uh, in, in that uh, exhibition, only the ambassador to Japan, uh, Olcock, exhibited the uh, private collection of Japanese objects. Uh, coincidentally, a Japanese embassy to Europe for the first time uh, sent uh, by the Edo government uh, happened to visit this exhibition, exhibition and uh, one, uh, some of the members of the delegation had uh, no, noted that uh, they are disappointed to see uh, the object exhibited by the uh, British uh, diplomats, which is not in the first quality. And uh, this is an interesting image of uh, samurais, the de delegations uh, passed in Cairo. Uh, this photo is take, taken by uh, Antonio Beato, who had a, a collaboration with Felice Beato. Uh, maybe Japanese scholars uh, know this name, uh, who is one of the uh, photographers who took the earliest photo of Yokohama. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, in this period, uh, the Ottoman Empire had the first national exhibition in Istanbul in 1863. 1867 Paris exhibition was uh, a first direct contact between uh, the Ottoman Empire and Japan, we can say. Uh, it is a making exhibition in the history of the, auto, uh, the universal exhibition also. And uh, the Ottoman Empire presented uh, pavilions for that exhibition, uh, representing mosque and uh, the summer residence Yalu, the building type of hammam, and uh, they created a, a honorary, honorary gate because the uh, Sultan Abdul Aziz, uh, the Ottoman Sultan, for the first time in the history, uh, visited to the land where he is not belonging, uh, it is not belonging to himself. So, uh, Ottoman exhibition was uh, very much uh, emphasized. <clears throat> and in the same exhibition, Japan uh, was uh, just at the end of Edo government, and there was this con famous conflict between Edo government and uh, Satsuma and Higo uh, independently uh, participate. So uh, there are 
three different uh, delegations represented uh, in official international uh, circumstances. And for this exhibition, uh, even the brother of younger brother of Shogun uh, Akitake was sent uh, to attend the opening ceremony. Uh, he was 14 years ago and uh, 14 years old and uh, considered that he's going to study after the uh, visit to the exhibition. This is actually imaginary portrait of the royal visit, uh, royal uh, visit to the exhibition, uh, being Akitake here and Abdulaziz here. Uh, actually, the, uh, between the Ottoman Empire and Egypt, uh, you see uh, Ismail Pasha here. Uh, there, they had a similar kind of conflict between uh, uh, about subject uh, sovereign was uh, who who was the sovereign etc <clears throat> and a 1873 vienna exhibition uh, it was the first officially participated by meiji government um, we we see the same image in the poster and uh, I, I put here the photography, but uh, I put also the um, illustration in the newspapers uh, because we can understand Western percep perception of this uh, exhibition in this way. Actually, uh, Japan's participation was um, became news, and uh, Sultan Abdul, later Sultan Abdul Hamid uh, the second at that time he was a prince uh, in a private account uh, i i found uh, something interesting between uh, concerning the uh, relation between the ottoman and japan uh, he is the sultan who uh, started the direct relation between japan in later period while he was a, a prince uh, when he he saw this news that Japan is going to participate officially, the Universal Exhibition, uh, he ordered to a um, person uh, to search about Japan in the uh, exhibition. That was the beginning of his uh, interest to Japan. The newspaper. Uh, published that the reason of participation for Japan in five, um, five uh, different reasons, uh, starting displaying the glo glories of Japan uh, or uh, encouragement of art and science, etc. The in, uh, important, interesting thing is that the third one, uh, Jap Japanese government was already uh, interested in founding the new museum for uh, Japan. Actually, the Ottoman Empire's participation to the uh, Universal Exhibition was uh, not that much uh, closely related uh, with the foundation of the muse museum. And 1873, uh, Vienna Exhibition, the Ottoman government exhibited uh, the replica of the Ahmed III fountain and also uh, the, uh, our book Usurumi, Usurumi Mari Osmani. And in the same period, 1872, Japan had the first national exhibition. So comparing to the Ottoman Empire, who had the first national exhibition in 1863, uh, there is a 10 years uh, difference between them. And 1878, I am just uh, skipping to pick up pick up what is important for us. Uh, in 1878, Paris exhibition, Japanese commissioners uh, presented the uh, catalog introducing geography and history of Japan, and that became the first written official history of Japan uh, in the modern sense. Uh, and it was also 
published in French. Uh, about this book, we are going to return in later uh, in later part of, of my talk. So please remember this. And uh, 1893 Chicago was important for Japanese uh, government. Presented uh, the replica of Ho'o uh, Byodoin Ho'odo and uh, presenting Japanese art in the inner space. And in this exhibition, Okakura Tenshin led the uh, presentation that um, they, they did a trial to make accept Japanese format of art uh, in the category of fine art. Instead, uh, in the uh, previous exhibitions uh, ha had uh, held in Europe, uh, they didn't accept, but for the first time in the United States, they accept the category of uh, Japanese painting as a category of fine art. But in the 1900s in Paris, uh, they couldn't succeed. A, 1893 uh, Chicago, the Ottoman exhibited uh, the Hippodrome, um, the obelisk and uh, the model of mosque, and uh, they presented the photographic album uh, of showing the empire also. And 1900 Paris, as I said, uh, in J Japanese section, they try to uh, make accept the uh, Japanese format of painting as a fine art, but uh, they didn't succeed. Uh, for this exhibition, they constructed the pavilion of the copy of Horyuji Temple that is going to be uh, important in the book. Uh, of our concern, uh, Eastward Lardu Japan. Uh, this is the photo from, the, from that book. And in the same exhibition, Ottomans uh, presented another kind of pavilion, a kind of um, hybrid architecture type. Uh, the architect was uh, Alexander Varoli, uh, who is a Levantine Ottoman and later naturalized as French. So now we came back to these two books. Uh, let me uh, start from the process of com compilation. Japanese case, uh, actually, both of these books uh, started uh, not only for the exhibition, but uh, started from uh, the other purpose book, and it convert it was converted to the uh, exhibition uh, occasion. Uh, the, for the Japanese case, the starting was uh, in 18, 1890. Uh, Okakura Tenshin used to teach history of Japanese art at Tokyo School of Arts, uh, the former uh, today's Geidai, uh, Tokyo, University of Tokyo of the Arts. And uh, next year, Okakura uh, asked to uh, Kuki Ryuichi, who, who was uh, later became the director of Tokyo National Museum uh, and high bureaucrat. Uh, and they asked the budget to uh, publish an uh, official book of Japanese history of Japanese art. So from the beginning, uh, it was an independent project, but uh, it didn't com complete uh, until 1900. So um, in 1897, when the uh, project of, for the 1900 Paris exhibition uh, occurred. This book project was converted to the publication uh, for the exhibition. 
And then uh, next year, Okakura uh, was forced to resign the Imperial Museum and uh, the position of director of Tokyo School of the Arts. So uh, from that point, Okakura uh, was quit from this book project. But uh, the uh, basement is, uh, as all of us know, basement of this uh, His World Large Japan book was founded by Okakura. And for the Ottoman case, uh, it started from the earthquakes, actually. Uh, in 1855, uh, there was a big earthquake uh, in the um, old capital city in Bursa. Uh, it is here. And uh, in, the, in this city, there are several uh, important early Ottoman monuments uh, from the 15th century and all damaged. So, that 1863, the governor, governor of Bursa uh, started the project for recon reconstruction of Bursa, uh, including the uh, cultural monuments. And uh, actually, this uh, governor, Ahmed Befik Efendi, uh, was a Francophone, and uh, he's known to be a first translator of Molière's work uh, also. So he invited French uh, engineers and architects uh, to reconstruction and to modernize uh, the city itself. So, um, the project started in this way, and uh, French uh, engineers uh, made research, and uh, they were reopened with the restoration. And uh, from that point, the cultural monuments uh, in Bursa was re recognized as a starting point of the Ottoman culture. And uh, in 1867 Paris exhibition, uh, the fragments from Bursa uh, monuments were already exhibited. So uh, at that point, Ottoman government uh, had recognized as the uh, important cultural monuments uh, and in 1869, we know that there was a book project on Bursa's monument in France, not in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, after the project, um, the, the, the 1873 Vienna exhibition uh, started, some part of the group of uh, specialists worked for the uh, Ottoman book, and some part uh, didn't. Uh, on that, I am going to mention later. And how about the authors of these two books? Uh, Japanese and uh, the Ottoman team, uh, we see that Kuki Ryuichi, the uh, later minister of uh, the works, and uh, the higher uh, position there is, is uh, Ibrahim Etem Pasha, who was uh, also the minister. Uh, they, they worked like a pat patronage of these uh, two books. And uh, we, we saw that Okakura Tenshin was a, a responsible person in the, at the first moment uh, for the content. Uh, let me see, uh, show you uh, from the Japanese part. Uh, we see the name of Ito Chuta for the section of architecture, and we know the relation between uh, Okakura and Ito Chuta. Uh, while he was Ito was uh, young, uh, he was very much influenced by Okakura, and he was invited to teach. Uh, history of architecture to uh, Okakura's um, to uh, Tokyo School of Arts under the Okakura's direction. And actually, uh, there are different groups 
of uh, scholars in this book project. Uh, we saw Ito and Okakura's relation, and Fukuchi, Fukuichi uh, had a, a conflict between Okakura, uh, and um, he led the um, movement to uh, force to Okakura to resign. So uh, that's how Okakura had to quit this project. But um, they are, uh, there's a, this debate that about the origin of Japanese art. Looking at uh, History of Large Japan, the, uh, the whole atmosphere is more nationalistic, uh, we, we must say, the nationalistic approach on Japanese uh, art, uh, starting with the first sentence as the Japanese uh, constitution of Japanese empire is very different from the other uh, nations of the world, uh, specializing, specializing uh, themselves and uh, stating that uh, Japanese people are uh, a big family. <clears throat> and this is the a very uh, fami familiar sentences for the nationalistic uh, expression. And uh, here we have a picture of Shoso in Imperial Repository, where all of us know that uh, they have treasures from a different part of the world, not only Japan, uh, coming from the Silk Road, uh, some parts from Persia, some parts from uh, India, Korea, etc. But uh, at that moment of the 1900s, uh, eastward to Japan, uh, these treasures from Shosoin are described uh, as some part, very little part, are uh, belonging to Chinese or Korean uh, made, but uh, most of them are obviously Japanese, uh, it says. Because uh, it is um, going back to the uh, first investigation of the Shosoin treasures uh, after Meiji Restoration in 1872, as uh, Professor Inoue Shoichi describes, describes uh, in very detail in his book, that um, there are different kinds of specialists who visited uh, for the first time uh, Shosoin repository uh, from the background of Kokugaku Japanology or Kangaku Sinology or uh, Yogaku Western knowledge. Uh, people, but actually nobody could uh, distinguish what is Japanese or uh, the other uh, influences because uh, they knew only Japanese object. So their impression was a kind of um, moved uh, to, to see the pure Japanese a beginning of cha pure Japanese uh, object, uh, according to, to the record. So today, nobody uh, has doubt that they are coming from uh, the West Asia, uh, including the materials and techniques and uh, the instrument itself. But uh, for the scholars uh, in the beginning of Meiji, uh, they they received this uh, the appearance of these uh, objects as pure Japanese. So in this book, uh, this kind of uh, appropriation was uh, reflected. Whereas after ten years, eighteen eighteen four, uh, Ernst Fenolosa, an American art historian and philosopher, and who, who taught at Tokyo uh, Imperial University, 
uh, when he visited, uh, he was amazed that to see in the very uh, heart of the uh, imperial culture of Japan, uh, he saw uh, influences of uh, Chinese, Korean, and uh, Persian, even Indian uh, traces, and he noted. And uh, we know that Okakura was the translator for uh, Fenorosa. So, uh, in the Japanese, um, Japanese books uh, background, all these uh, arguments is reflected. As for the Ottoman uh, books authors, uh, we see Marie Dronet, Pietro Montani, Eugene Meyer. Actually, all these uh, non Ottoman, uh, Marie Dronet being French. May, may are also French. Pietro Montani, he was grown up in the Ottoman Empire, but uh, as a, a born, as his born, he is Italian. And both Shashian, he is Ottoman, uh, but with Armenian origin. So um, I didn't mention about the language of these books. Uh, Japanese case, the original text was written in Japanese and translated into French because uh, it was presented in Paris exhibition. Uh, as for the Usul, the original text was not in Turkish uh, but in French and translated into two languages, uh, into the Ottoman Turkish and uh, German because this book was presented in Vienna. So there are translators, and there are difference of the backgrounds of translators too. Uh, Mehmet Shevki Effendi for the Ottoman book, uh, he was a professional uh, uh, Ottoman official uh, for the Ministry of Trade and Public Works and uh, professional experience in translation. And he speaks five languages, uh, except Turkish, uh, Arabic, Persian, French, German, and English. So um, Ottoman Empire had um, their own human resources, whereas Japan didn't. Uh, Emmanuel Tronquois, uh, a French, and he's the second translator for French embassy in Tokyo. And uh, there was an interesting research on Emmanuel Tronquois by uh, Christoph Macke, and he was uh, also, uh, he, his, his career is very totally unknown until recently, and uh, his, uh, in, his role is important also as a collector uh, of Japanese uh, publications. So let me uh, go to the structure of two books. The Ottoman one uh, had, is consists of three volumes. Uh, the first, General History of Ottoman Architecture and the Description of Principles of Ottoman Architecture with the brief uh, general view of Ottoman history itself. And second, monographic works of eight individual edifices and the third, Notes on Ottoman Ornamentation and Mimar Sinan's List of Works. Uh, and uh, that, whereas Japanese one is very strict with the chronology and uh, the time span uh, dealing with the Usul was uh, almost only the Ottoman Empire. That means uh, from the from the end of, of the 13th century until present. Present means until 1873. And a Japanese case from the uh, starting from prep history, Jomon to actually uh, to the end of Edo. And they don't in, include the Meiji, the present time. 
And uh, the chronology goes uh, from the first period to Tokugawa era, uh, excluding Meiji. And uh, the first part going according to the reign of the emperors and uh, from the second uh, volume, it is according to the shogun's reign. And all these volumes uh, had sections uh, dealing painting, sculpture, architecture, and artistic crafts. And these categories are, uh, of course, according to the Western category. Whereas uh, Ottomans didn't apply uh, these uh, categories and they only choose uh, the architecture because, uh, in my opinion, uh, architecture was the only category that uh, fit to the Western uh, system. And uh, the Ottoman didn't insist uh, traditional, they are traditional uh, field of art such as calligraphies or illumination, uh, hat or uh, tez heap, etc. Uh, to present uh, insistently in the section of fine arts in Western uh, universal exhibitions, uh, where Jap Japanese tried to do. So, uh, I mentioned in 1893 uh, Chicago exhibition, uh, Japanese commissions uh, failed to, I'm sorry, uh, succeeded to uh, accept Japanese uh, painting and artistic crafts uh, as a fine art section, and 1900 Paris exhibition, they, they failed. Uh, here also in the text, uh, they created the section of bijutsuteki koge, uh, artistic crafts, if I translate it directly. Uh, but in French text, it is translated as uh, only arts applique, uh, presenting uh, traditional works of metal and textile and ceramics and lacquer works. Uh, those are uh, regarded as a very important item of export for the uh, Japanese government at that period also. And of course, uh, starting from the 1873, uh, the word Japonism, uh, the tendency, European tendency for the Japanese art uh, occurred. So uh, Japanese government was a uh, very much uh, interested in presented, presenting Japanese art as a fine art for the uh, Western category also. So uh, we can see the trace of this in the text of Histoire de l'art de Japon, uh, stating that um, according to the hierarchical system of Western uh, art and um, of course the painting was the top of the hierarchy top of the pyramid and uh, crafts are regarded in the bottom but uh, according to uh, Japanese uh, specialists that uh, crafts work are uh, in the level of fine arts in western category so this 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 was the important point for the uh, Japanese uh, Japanese uh, presentation of culture in the Universal Exhibition. And then uh, I'd like to mention about uh, European classical tradition seen in both two books. Uh, Usurumi Mari Osmani uh, in the uh, especially in the uh, theoretical part, uh, the trace is obvious using the Vitruvius uh, Roman uh, theory, a theory of uh, architecture uh, using the three orders of uh, architecture uh, in the Ottoman 
architecture too. Uh, the right author of this section, uh, Pietro Montani, applied uh, Vitruvius uh, categorization of uh, three orders into uh, the Ottoman architecture. And uh, for the Japanese part, uh, that in the section of architecture, act actually uh, in the Japanese book, uh, section of architecture was inserted later. It was not included in the project from the beginning. Uh, and uh, the quantity of the pages are also very little, uh, like 10% of the whole pages. And the writer, author of the architecture section is, as we know, Ito Chuta. And uh, he became, with, with, uh, this, with this description, uh, he became the first uh, architecture historian uh, in Japan. And uh, he has uh, this theory that uh, the origin of Japanese architecture is connected to Greek, ar Greek architecture because uh, his starting standing point, uh, he has two standing, standing points being the uh, both columns of uh, Horyuji Temple and uh, the oldest structure uh, of Japan and um, Greek architecture had emphasis, slight, uh, slight swellings of uh, the column's body and uh, the depiction of honeysuckles observed in Tamamushi no Zushi preserved in also Horyuji Temple uh, being from the 6th century and uh, we see the detailed uh, image of honeysuckle on Tamamushi no Zushi uh, that is considered uh, traveled from uh, Greek uh, art to uh, Japan through China and Korea. And actually, uh, honeysuckle was um, on the light, left hand, we see the image of honeysuckle. Uh, in Japanese, it is suikazura. But um, in the book, it was mistranslated uh, as acanthus. But anyway, uh, Itochuta's uh, theory um, being the origin of Japanese architecture, uh, being a Greek architecture. Um, in the same book, uh, so I'm sorry, um, I continue with the Tochuta. So in order to prove his theory, he uh, go out from Japan to travel uh, three years and 300 to search the origin of Japanese uh, architecture uh, all the way to Greece. And in the end of the travel, he uh, got this idea of uh, theory of evolution theory of architecture, uh, mapping all the uh, different elements of the world architecture. And in this, uh, coming back to the book of Japanese, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I'm, I'm sorry, I. Uh, eastward large Japan. Uh, it is interesting that um, Ito Chuta uh, stating the origin of Japanese architecture being Greek architecture, and uh, there is this um, contradiction that uh, in the other part of the same book uh, dealing with uh, paintings or uh, artistic crafts and the origin of Japanese art is uh, stated rather pure uh, Japanese uh, elements. Uh, 
So there is uh, this contradiction. And coming back uh, to the uh, Ito Chuta's notion of world, world architecture, uh, I'd like to look at the world views of two books. In the um, Usurumi Mani Osmani uh, compares uh, their own architecture, the character of their own architecture, with the other uh, cultures, uh, being ancient Egypt, ancient India, Chinese, ancient Greece, Roman, Arab, Gothic, Persian, Mughals. So uh, it had uh, it took consider consideration uh, with the other Islamic dynasties as well as uh, ancient uh, European uh, element also. Looking at eastward to Japan, uh, Japanese worldview is rather uh, narrow according to com comparing to the uh, Ottoman one being uh, only Chinese and Western countries and uh, the, the basement of Western countries is being wrong according to Japanese one and uh, Usuru they uh, defined the character of the Ottoman architecture as a noble severity. And looking at the other uh, cultures, we have this similarity with the ancient Greece. Uh, here also we can point out the uh, tendency to the Western classical tradition. Uh, it says uh, assault that is severe and polished. So there is a similarity. Uh, their character uh, similar to Greece, whereas uh, Romans, um, in the theory, they uh, applied the Roman theory and just mentioning very shortly Roman as a pomp. And another thing uh, that draw our attention is the mentioning about Gothic architecture uh, with many words. It says a subtree of thought and delicacy and of the logic pushed to its extreme. So uh, when we look at the uh, interest on Greece and literary interest to Roman and uh, interest more on Gothic, uh, here we can uh, understand the tendency of European architecture history of that period uh, being in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the, um, the conflict between the Greek and Roman architecture in academism. And speaking about Gothic architecture, of course, uh, we uh, remind this uh, personality, Eugène Emmanuel Bure Le Duc, who is an uh, architectural uh, theoretician, uh, charismatic uh, on that period, uh, who uh, restaurant of Notre Dame de Paris. And actually, there is an important connection between uh, Bure Le Duc and the Ottoman uh, history writing of architecture. Uh, with this person, Leon Parbinet, he was um, a disciple of Viola Le Duc, and uh, for the restoration works in Bursa's monument, he was involved in the team of French specialists. And later on, in 1874, he published a book on Ottoman architecture. Uh, entitled Architecture et Décoration Turco XV Siècle. And uh, we see this is uh, only one year difference between Usurumi Mali and this book. And uh, I am going to mention later on. In this book, uh, Leon Parbinet uh, 
describes that uh, he tried to apply the theory of uh, Gothic architecture just issued uh, the, year, the same year he was working in Bursa, uh, Viole Duc's uh, book, and uh, he tried to do it, this uh, geometrical uh, analysis, anal analysis to the Ottoman uh, early uh, monuments, and uh, it works. And uh, according to Parvin Le, um, all these Islamic motifs are solved in this theory. So this is the um, similarity between Usul and um, this book, uh, the geometrical uh, analysis and also a theoretical approach to architecture that was not seen in Japanese case. And uh, it is interesting that in this book, entitled Architecture Decoration Turk, not Ottoman, whereas uh, the other book, uh, Usulu Mimani Osmani, was translated as L'Architecture Ottoman, and they didn't use the word Turk. And um, Violet Duc, in the Turkish book, uh, in the um, the other book, uh, he discussed about the origin of Turkish because uh, so in the book of Usulu, uh, they, they define the character of the Ottoman uh, architecture as uh, noble severity. And uh, here in the book published in France, uh, there is an ambiguous status of Turkish character. So that's why also uh, in the book of Usulu, um, the character of the Ottoman architecture should be defined. And let me go to conclusion. Um, actually, history writing for Japanese uh, architecture and uh, Japanese architecture and art started uh, parallel with the development of participation of uh, the universal exhibition being a 1878 uh, Paris exhibition, their first history book. Actually, this project uh, continued and resulted as the first national official national history book, A Grants to National History, uh, published in 1889, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 1900. Um, the same year, actually, the history of Eastward Japan was published. So, um, the a basement of history writing was started as the uh, project for the universal exhibition and completed uh, in the same period of 1900. As for the uh, edition of Histoire de l'Art de Japon, the French original was uh, published with the 1,000 copies and uh, published in Paris. Next year, the original Japanese text was published in Japan. We don't know how much copies were uh, printed, but uh, at least the 1901, uh, 1901 edition was not that much uh, as number and also uh, it was very expensive, so it was not for the uh, diffusion, but in the uh, after seven years, they uh, made the copy another copy for the diffusion. So 
uh, here we can understand that uh, with the project of history book, uh, the grants, grants of Japanese history, and also uh, with the uh, History of Large Japan, and there was a national project to uh, educate the people to have a, a common view on the history and uh, actually the system of chronology that was applied in the Eastward Lardu Japon book was uh, approximately the same that uh, we use present also. So um, the book project was uh, successfully uh, continued to make an image of national art or make image of national history in Japanese case. And uh, for the as for the Ottoman case, of course, the Ottoman em Empire collapsed in the 1923. So the image of the national was uh, totally different uh, from the present, of course. But uh, we can trace kind of sister project, sister edition of this book. Uh, one is. Uh, the book on costume, which was published at the same occasion of Vienna exhibition. And the other was uh, Leon Parvinet's book on architecture et decoration turc. Uh, that was more uh, contributed for the diffusion of the image of uh, uh, Turkish architecture. And uh, in the end, I'd like to show you some after aftermath story of these uh, two countries. Ten years ago, I had the chance to uh, make research on the Japanese object owned, uh, preserved in the national palaces uh, in Turkey. And organized some workshops with the specialists from Japan and Turkey and France, etc. And uh, we came across with this huge base of Arita. And after these uh, workshops, we found out that this base uh, currently preserved in Dolma Bahçe Palace uh, here in Istanbul, it was the exactly the same physically same uh, base that were presented in the 1872 and uh, 73 Vienna exhibition by the Japanese Commission. Actually, at 1873. Japanese uh, Vienna exhibition. The section, Ottoman and Japanese sections were side by side. So I'm sure that uh, someone who saw this uh, base uh, bought and brought to uh, Istanbul in Doma Bahce Palace. So uh, this is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. And I quit my presentation here. So can I can I quit my presentation now? Yeah, I think you can. And my screen share to stop presenting. Well, yes. Thank you very much. Ah, I'm sorry. It was a very nice uh, talk. Thank you. Um, uh, let, let me show you uh, on site the Bosporus. And uh, we are now in Asian side and looking at the European side. And in front, we see on the seashore, there's a 
a white big huge building that is the doma of palace mm -hmm. uh, that the the base i showed uh, is preserved now thank you for the view as well ah. <laughs> Well, um, thank you very much. And uh, I won't say anything at the moment, but let me just hand over to uh, Professor Mitter, who will uh, comment. And then after that, uh, Professor Hladik would uh, say a few words also. And then we'll open up for general discussion. Pastor, so, please. How long would you like me to speak? 10 minutes. Uh, oh, okay. more, longer <laughs> if you like. If, Depends on if you want to speak more, go, go right ahead. No, no, I'm uh, fine. Um, first of all, I do remember that view. I think it's from your house, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's wonderful. Yes, yes. <laughs> I do remember a lot of memories. And uh, I know I've seen actually Paolo is here as well. Hello. Yes. <laughs> okay, now, uh, you know, this is amazing paper. It is so, you know, rich, full of ideas so many different things so i've really uh, you know it's a wonderful subject and because you speak japanese and read japanese and you also read turkish and know about ottoman uh, culture in a way your work is very very interestingly as a sort of horizontal history a lot of people are now working like you know um sanya subramanian and others looking at things not vertically the west and the rest but you know much more kind of interlinks and you i mean i like your comparison very much because in many ways uh Turkey has very little with you know common with japan but and yet you compare that's the interesting thing. both what they shared and how they differed and so that that's very interesting um two two texts uh, of course very very important um here what i felt and very interesting that um you know thinking about the great um international exhibitions it began in london 1851 it went on to paris and so on and chicago and the main aim was of course first of all showing off the triumph of science in the west but because of whole range of um let's a subtext like empire in india what did they produce how can we look at that stuff and also other areas with japan what is very interesting you mentioned that and both also with ottoman but there there is a distinction from renaissance that there is fine arts and there's practical arts it these didn't exist in India, Japan. But the interesting thing is that, of course, there were great paintings, of course, but they didn't think in these terms, painting, calligraphy, mm -hmm. etc., uh, evolving of substance, but Europeans categorized immediately in the exhibition. So East uh, non-European works, because um, their painting wasn't three-dimensional academic, so more like, you know, applied arts and so that that's the background and it's very interesting how it started off and here you see that something very interesting turkey half exotic very strong link with europe from the beginning you think of all the way including vienna mozart and so on uh japan is totally exotic there is no knowledge about it so when they're shown there's a lot of interest of course uh, the other thing is that already in the late 19th century uh, impressionists and others were absolutely fascinated with the uh, woodcuts you know hiroshige uh, utamaro and you know uh, Hokusai, and that became very important so that has a very important element there again comparing i think ottoman architecture is very important and you actually uh, mentioned i think that uh, until uh, vienna of course i mean on the whole architecture stressed in ottoman japan more 
objects and various things. So that's the whole background to international fairs and exhibitions, how these um, countries are displayed. It's true of India as well. And, and it is very interesting that unwritten kind of um, agenda that European oil painting is the best and it's fine arts only. Therefore, Japanese painting, how beautiful, Mughal painting, how beautiful, they're not fine arts. Interestingly enough, Ravi Varma was like Hamdi Bey and he showed his works in Chicago. They were in the applied arts, not given the status of, although he painted in oil painting, academic art. So there was this interesting um, imperialism, orientalism, whatever you might call it. Okay, now we come to a very important aspect, the books. And that's where I'm as fascinated what you told me, in you know, us rather, and Usul in Memari Osmani, written by French and then kind of translated in Turkish. Histoire de l'art de Japon, uh, translated from the Japanese, right? Am I correct? So that's yes. an interesting contrast. Again, if I, I'm thinking of India, art history constructed by Europeans, Ferguson first, and then in 1873 in Bengali, there's a very, not that much well-known, short history of uh, Indian art written by Bengali. So that's the mm -hmm. kind of first national art history. Uh, so also I find now, this is very interesting, a kind of divergence between official publicity of Europeans and the construction of nationhood in Japan. Let's say, first take Japan. Mm. Very interesting. This is the emergence of notion of purity and how Japan, em Japan emerged. And as you, as you know very well, um, art history in Japan started with Japanese art, uh, sorry, G German art history, and then it's constructed. And um, so there, the aim was to create a constructive kind of uh, idea of Japanese art as part of nationality, now no, nationhood, and this notion of purity. Ottoman, more heterogeneous, because Turkish Empire is always mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, actually run by mostly foreigners. That's the strength and the interesting thing about Ottoman Empire. Therefore, I mean, a lot of interest in architecture you talk about. Um, and there, you see, um, much more close to European architecture. A, Islamic architecture mm -hmm. is much more rational in the sense, in the European sense, much closer. Therefore, it's heterogeneous because it, the Ottomans didn't think of this as very different. Actually, they were the sick men of Europe, you know. So, in that sense, the very different approach to art history. And um, so, th that, that's an interesting issue. Uh, I won't go too much in the, but so many in interesting things you talk about, then Ito Chuta uh, talking about diffusion, Greece, Buddhism, Mm -hmm. Turkey, you know, you know, Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, Buddhist element is not probably true, and uh, as well as other elements in Japan. One thing I want to come to, and this is a thing you raise very interestingly. Here you have construction of uh, Japanese history of art from the ancient times up to Tokugawa period, just before the kind of modernization. But um, interestingly. You have the uh, art school run by Fontanese. Mm -hmm. And of course, Okakura is kind of initially involved with all this. Then do you see uh, that, and there is an interesting issue with Fenelosa, they're proposing Pan-Asianism, a much more mixture. I uh, Coca-Cola came to Calcutta, as you know, lived and r r wrote his book, uh, the ideals of the East, I strongly believed in uh, the, you know, mm -hmm. all Asia sharing ideas. I think it's a myth, very powerful mm -hmm. myth. 
created by Orientalists, but it actually provided a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Okakura's uh, life and story as well, as you know. And I can consider a tragic figure eventually left out. So I want to ask you, so the whole history of art of Japan and constructed, how that, does that fit in with this art school teaching? For a while, Japanese artists, painters were absolutely, it, it couldn't even sell their works. Then you have the whole idea of Okakura, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, coming in and uh, uh, so as opposed to yoga art. So they are asserting Japanese-ness and that's what Okakura brings in. And that's, um, there's a conflict. So I, I'm very fascinated. I won't go too much uh, now because so much there I could go on for another half an hour, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and I thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. Rich. I want to hear more and I would love to read more as you write. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, Professor Mitter, for that comment. And uh, can I ask Muriel to say a few words now? Do you need to, uh, do you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah we can hear you. Okay. Fine. Okay, so thank you very much for your invitation. And of course, uh, uh, thank you very much to, to Miyuki uh, for this uh, very remarkable talk uh, on, on the margins. And uh, thank you as well for the comment for Professor Mitter. So maybe I go a bit in the same direction. And um, yeah, as we know each other since quite a long time, I was always amazed by your uh, huge knowledge and, of course, uh, being <laughs> perfectly uh, speaking uh, Japanese, Turkish, English, French and Italian. It's totally <laughs> remarkable and it makes this more interesting, of course. Um, and your position, was, of course, being in Istanbul, just between East and West, so <laughs> how to think of margin, and this is quite a very philosophical question, so, and how this margin defined themselves, and then how they were anchored into the modernity, it's also very interesting. Um, so my first question or small remark is maybe a bit technical, so a bit semantic -y. and um, well, it's about architectures, not only art, but also architectures, and somehow also the difference between how it is received into the international exhibitions and show for Western audience and how it is teach in the university. So as you point out this uh, link or this uh, translation uh, for architecture into Kenshiku for, uh, for, the, for the Japanese and of course also for the Turkish. I do not know so much about the Turkish, so I don't know so much. Um, and how also Ito Chuta tried to shift uh, from a more technical view to a more finite, fine art view. And uh, this has a bit to do also with the difference within European country, uh, where maybe the distinctions uh, of England and Germany, where it's more uh, engineering, architecture is more related to engineering. Uh, whereas in French, you have the famous Ecole des Beaux-Arts, of course, uh, the Academy of Beaux-Arts founded after the French Revolution at the end of the, of the 18th century. So, um, and maybe, well, I don't go into details, but maybe in the, in the, in the framework of universal exhibition, architecture will be related to fine art. Whereas in the university, maybe architecture is more related to engineering, following, of course, the influence of Josiah Kunder and so on. So that's just a little distinction I wanted to put on, on architectures. Um, and then my second question was about the distinction between uh, 
Bijutsu uh, and craft Gaijutsu. So, mm -hmm. as uh, already uh, Professor Meta um, um, underlined, uh, there is a strong uh, distinction inside European context, which is definitely not the same for the Japanese context and, and the Turkish one. And I wanted to say that maybe at a time uh, the West is somehow looking to the Orient to find a reconstruction of this of themselves, or they are looking into craft in a way. And it's why there is this uh, Japanese movement, but as well as this art and craft movement. So uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the Westerns uh, at that time would be more interested in craft. Nevertheless, uh, the Japanese, they would try to define what is fine art. So, um, well, I will skip the other uh, question, but uh, maybe another small question you mentioned that um, uh, this monumental work of uh, the uh, the Histoire de l'Art du Japon published in the 19 were first written into uh, Japanese uh, and it's of course a very long uh, project uh, beginning in the 897 uh, I think uh, but how would the translation? So you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Emmanuel Tronquois mm -hmm. who translated it into French. Mm -hmm. And there is actually this article on Christophe Marquet mm -hmm. on yeah. this needle's mm -hmm. work. Um, and I just wanted to, yeah, uh, just emphasize that, uh, of course, uh, the curator of the exhibition. Um, um, Hayashi um, Tadamasa is well known as a as a as a dealer, art dealer, and uh, with many connection with the Japanese. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the personality of Emmanuel Concois is a bit uh, forgotten; he is a bit in the shadow. Uh, nevertheless, his personality is quite interesting because he translated a lot of books. And at that time, he was trying to write a dictionary, so a Japanese-French dictionary. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has an interesting role as a go-between uh, between, uh, Japan and France at that time, let's say. And also a bit, um, well, a singular personality, which stay a bit in the shadows. And as you mentioned, he has also a collection and his collection was um, then given to the Musée Guimet in Paris and a part also in the Musée des Arts Déco to use as a pattern. So again, this thematic of craft, which is uh, really interesting. Um, well, just a, a small uh, remark that just at the end, uh, I, I found really interesting your presentation and also, of course, um, what you trust as well, uh, beside uh, the already well known and well uh, studying uh, on an international level, the, the, the traces of Japanese and of course the strong influence of the ukiyo-e and collection and so on. But the reverse point of view seeing for the, from the margin and from uh, Japan and Turkey. Um, so how this westernization is uh, perceived from inside, from, from the inside country, and how it can be a, a kind of adoption and appropriation of uh, the different concept of uh, fine art and architecture. So that's that's really uh, uh, very intriguing in your paper. And uh, I am also um, yeah, very much looking forward for, for your uh, uh, next uh, publication on those topics. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mingri. That's my short comments. Thank yeah. you, thank you very much. But uh, before I hand it back to you, uh, you keep, I just wondered if there's any other questions people have, uh, if they'd like to. Yeah, switch I their can answer. 
Yes, uh, some of them. But I forgot uh, sorry, to... Uh, sorry, uh, mute. just one second. In case anyone ah, wants okay. to ask a question, please ask, then we can club it together and uh, get a response. Uh, I, I'd like to un answer now. Uh, you know, I know, but I, because of time, <laughs> I thought I'd get uh, any audience reaction <laughs> first. Just in case. Uh, uh, okay. Um, well, at the moment, there don't seem to be any. So uh, I, let me just ask, uh, uh, also put in a few comments. Uh, yes. One, I think, uh, you know, as the others have said, certainly uh, it was a very interesting and broad ranging comparison, bringing in uh, countries which are not normally seen together. So I must say that in the 70s and 80s, there used to be a lot of comparisons of Turkey and Japan, particularly in politics and mobilizations and so forth. Um, I was just thinking that, um, you know, you see the time lag between Turkish uh, reforms and uh, edicts and institutional setting up of institutions in Japan. But in a way, I think if we look at the broader picture from the Tanzimat reforms, what you're seeing in the Ottomans is a bureaucratic monarchy emerging. You know, the power of the uh, sultans is being reduced and much the same process takes place in Japan in the period from 1868 to the 1890 when the constitution is set up. And in a way they're facing similar problems. You know, there is a so-called superior colonial culture and they're trying to fit in their ideas uh, within that. Uh, so. What I found, uh, for instance, as a historian, I think uh, Okakura plays a very interesting role in writing a history of Japan, or at least he had made extensive notes, actually. Uh, he didn't publish it as a, uh, a book. But what is interesting is that it differs from the, if you will, the officially sponsored history. Because as you would know that when the reforms, uh, Meiji uh, revolution took place in 1868, in January, one of the first acts of the new government was actually to set up a, a Bureau of Historiography to document and lay out the basis of their, the reasons for their, you know, uh, why they were establishing a government and, you know, uh, supporting this intellectually. So history plays a very crucial role in this. Mm -hmm. And you know there were these samurai like uh, Kumi Kunitake and others who uh, learned from the well the so-called National School of Learning, which had begun to differentiate Japan from China as an independent culture, laid the basis for Japanese nationalism and so on and so forth. And but what was interesting to me is that uh, in Okakura. One, you don't see uh, the emphasis on the classical Heian Japan, which emerges later. Um, he, he talks of uh, actually Hideyoshi, you know, in the uh, 16th century as the beginning of uh, the modern Japan. He sees Tokugawa as a great tyranny, a feudal tyranny and so forth. And he has his own problems, I think, because he sees, I mean, he, he has to, in a way, understand and justify foreign influence coming into Japan, and yet that forming Japanese culture, which is a little different from the official narrative. And uh, mm -hmm. he sees that as, uh, uh, he looks at Asia as, uh, well, bound together in many ways, but that unity, if you will, was destroyed by the Mongols. And, you know, that creates its own problem. So he's looking at, a uh, way to counter the West now. And he goes through all sorts of, he has his contradictions, but on the whole, I think he played a very important role in trying to think about new modes of consciousness to create a new Asia. Now, even if one doesn't, I think the later, after he dies, the government uses his Asia as one as a slogan for the, all the wrong mm -hmm. reasons. But <laughs> you know, he, he plays, an, I think that's an extremely important thing because when he comes to India, like Ito Chuta, they actually I mean, are pretty well read in the Western literature, but they actually look at Indian architecture, art, not as something of you know what the natives have done and so forth mm -hmm. as within the colonial framework. I mean, Ito Chuta is uh, amazed by the beauty of the uh, Kailash temple in Elora. 
Uh, he compares it to the Parthenon, which he still hasn't seen. Uh, he, you know, I mean, like for the Indians, the Japanese also, the Greek ideals had become important. But uh, he's impressed by the Orissa temples. He loves Calcutta. He doesn't like Bombay, and you know, it goes on that way. So, but he's, he's looking at it with uh, uh, sort of fresh eyes, if you will. So that was, and he, I thought, uh, to sort of address what Muriel was saying, I thought he looked at in, uh, architecture as engineering. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, he also, I think, much like, uh, is also caught up in these colonial ideas where he begins to differentiate between indigenous Shinto architecture and uh, mm -hmm. Buddhist Buddhist architecture you can change, but it's not, it's not mm -hmm. the home of our gods. These are foreign gods. So I think there's some of that going on as well. Uh, but anyway, these were just a few comments I thought I'd make. And, but again, thank you very much. And if there are no questions, then I'll let you uh, address some of the questions which have been put forward. Ah. Miyuki, please. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, I I am appreciate that uh, you made a lot of uh, comments and uh, question. Thank you. So I, I, I don't know if I can uh, answer to each of them uh, sufficiently. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to start with the um, uh, ukiyo-e and the influence of ukiyo-e and Japanese. What I forgot to mention in my talk was uh, the hierarchical system within the Japanese uh, art in the book of Histoire de l'Art de Japon. Actually, uh, they didn't mention about ukiyo-e in that book because uh, ukiyo-e was not considered as high art in that uh, period, Japanese art. So um, the uh, ukiyo-e was very popular uh, because it is um, a copy and copied art, so uh, it diffused in Europe a lot. But uh, it was like a newspaper uh, in Japanese culture. So uh, that was a, there is a kind of um, different temperature between Japan and European audiences. And uh, that is what actually uh, about Muriel mentioned about margins, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, both country always uh, concern about the European perceptions of their cultures, uh, as if there is no other uh, cultures but Europe. <laughs> So uh, what I wanted to uh, try with this talk was um, to comparing these two books and how was the attempt and also uh, the glance between the non-European countries. Uh, actually, I had some uh, evidences uh, found uh, Japanese used to look at the Ottoman Empire in the moment of 1873 Vienna exhibition they uh, they didn't have kind of uh, prejudice concerning so-called Middle Eastern uh, country but in the 1900 I saw kind of prejudice like through the European bias uh, toward the Ottoman culture. So that is a small difference between, uh, according to the period also. And uh, both Parter and uh, Muriel mentioned about the educational system and also the category of engineering and architecture, also the uh, category of art and crafts. Uh, actually, it is true that uh, Japanese educational system of architecture 
uh, took after, I think, Northern European system. So the architecture was always uh, in the school of engineering. So uh, Ito Chuta was graduate of Tokyo Imperial University, and before it was Kobu Daigakko, the uh, College of uh, Engineering. So obviously, it is coming from the uh, School of Engineering. So what he proposed uh, for the translation of architecture, Kenchiku, was to put some element of uh, artistic side of uh, architecture. Actually, uh, Tokyo Geidai today uh, has the faculty of architecture, but I think it was added later on, not from the beginning. And uh, in the book project also, uh, the section of architecture was not planned in Okakura's uh, so uh, it was in the I think in the end of yeah uh, in 18, 19, 1978 uh, Kuki Ryuichi uh, gave a lecture in Kyoto about the cultural property of Japan and uh, Ito Chuta was that time, at that time in Kyoto for the construction of Heian Jingu. And then he attended to the lecture. And uh, later on, he wrote a letter to Kuki, why you didn't include architecture into your lecture. And that's how Kuki invited uh, Ito uh, to the commission. But uh, at that time, Ito Chuta was uh, Heian Jingu was the first work after his graduation that he was like 27 years old. And uh, Ito Chuta, uh, in his memory, he remembers that uh, in the commissions of uh, cultural property, uh, he was the only young, uh, the others being with the white beards, etc. So um, maybe Ito Chuta was the person who and try to try to uh, put the element of art into architecture, but he was from the background of engineering. Well, the other thing, ah, uh, and also about the categorization of applied art and uh, fine art. Uh, yes, the backgrounds of art and crafts movement of the period in the 1880s, starting from the 1880s, was uh, extremely important for the uh, Japanese uh, statement of Bijutsu Kogei, the Kogei crafts being not only the just koge, but uh, the part of bijutsu, the fine arts. Yeah, uh, that that is an important element, I think. And also uh, for the tronkwa, uh, actually, soon after I decided to uh, the topic, uh, what what I am going to speak, I uh, ordered a book from Japan. And this arrived just two two days ago. <laughs> uh, this is um, about the Tronkwa cole collection. And uh, in this book, I, I found the work by Christophe Marquet. I, I wonder if he uh, published in French also. Uh, and here I... I learned for the first time about the life of Emmanuel Tronkwa. And uh, yeah, it was the translators are always ignored, but actually very important. And I found uh, this time I tried to do um, comparison between the original Japanese text and uh, the 
French translation. I must say it is very well done. And some parts, Tronqua uh, add some explanation because uh, with only the uh, direct translation uh, for the Western audience, it is not enough to make them understand. So uh, as it is written in this book, uh, Tronqua uh, had a huge knowledge on Japanese art and history. So uh, they did a good choice for the translator. Oh. Are there any questions, any more comments, questions? Oh, please. Uh, any? My husband <laughs> wants to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Can you unmute, Paolo? Unmute. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, no, I, I may also ask you later at lunch, but... <laughs> It's, uh, it's something <laughs> no. Uh, so uh, it, it was very nice being uh, taking part to this meeting. I was also very happy to see again Professor uh, Mitter and uh, <laughs> uh, Muriel uh, Hasik, uh, and uh, and also uh, Professor Tank. I think we met many years ago at Boazi, but uh, well, probably yes. I was there for yeah. a short while. Oh. No. <laughs> So thank you for organizing this. No, I, one uh, one thing I was wondering uh, beyond this relation between engineering, architecture, the different uh, uh, notion of there is also an element of material. I mean, both yeah. Ottoman and Japanese architecture have a strong uh, use of wood. Uh, timber is is very important in both traditions, but. Usul totally ignores, I mean, Usul decides to present only the monumental side of Ottoman architecture, which is mosques, fountains are made of stone, because that brings Ottoman architecture closer to Europe. And it's interesting that Japan, in the beginning, did not include architecture in the first project of the larger Japan, probably because of this issue with material i mean the, probably because the, the european public would not accept or would not understand that there is an important uh, legacy of of architecture even monument I mean, the temples are are, are wooden and it, so but but then uh, ito Chuta comes out with this theory of uh, the greek roots and then makes it also more so, so then in the end uh, he's included so uh, just uh, yeah I, I was just wondering what what how can we consider material as as entering in this discussion <clears throat> yeah actually um it is interesting one turkish architect who was that uh, the uh, the famous person he uh, mentioned also in the development of modern architecture also in Turkey, uh, they regard modernization for Turkish architecture is uh, excluding timber architecture. If the more yeah. it goes to concrete and glass, <laughs> uh, yes. modern. And uh, in some Point, at some point, Ito Chuta, uh, architecture evol evolution of architecture theory, uh, he also proposed the same thing. Uh, he uh, he stated that he stated that uh, Japanese architecture uh, based in wood, but from now on, modernizing, uh, going to stone and concrete architecture. So yeah. that is very interesting, <laughs> complex to <Yeah>. the <laughs> modern or uh, European yeah. architecture. I, I wonder how how was in India. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the wooden architecture disappears, so it's yeah, it's <laughs> mostly stone. <clears throat> 
Part yes, of this is an interesting the, point, but it's also hierarchy of architecture. Hierarchy. So, as you say, wooden architecture is not regarded as as important as yeah. stone and brick architecture. Of course, looking back to Europe, and also uh, European art historians like Ferguson, architectural historian, to him, arch, which is Roman Islamic as well is the true architecture. And he dismisses mm -hmm. Hindu temples as simply not architecture. This is uh -huh. by piling stone on stone. So there are these elements where wooden, wood isn't considered very important and uh, methods of building, uh, you know, kind of lie at the whole, whole center of these things. So, I mean, they're yep. pretty much uh, <coughs> part of the hierarchy of arts. Mm -hmm. But that's why I think Ito also uh, was quite happy to modernize uh, Buddhist temples. He says as long in the, mm -hmm. they could be earthquake uh, proof, yeah. they could use yeah. concrete, as long as the skin is uh, mm -hmm. traditional, but you can't touch Shinto shrines because they're the home of our gods. So that's why national identity is gradually being uh, linked, I think. Mm -hmm. That element yes. is there also. Of course, Parthenon was originally wooden structure, and then <laughs> yeah, <there>. also that. <laughs> I mean, it shows you know, elements there. Mm. Well, uh, if there are no questions, no hands being raised, let me uh, thank uh, Aoki first for a brilliant presentation and a. Uh, you know, laying the basis for a very, very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Partha and Muriel, for your uh, yeah. critical comments. They were uh, they opened it up, and thank you, Paolo, also. Um, and thank everyone you. came here. And, thank you uh, for organizing. <laughs> I hope we can carry on this because I think Gito mm -hmm. Chita was also very interesting. Actually, we didn't get into it, but I think he did try, and from what he learned in his travels in Southeast and in India and uh, West Asia, he did try to use those elements in um, Japanese architecture. The fact mm -hmm. is, of course, uh, Japanese establishment wasn't really interested in incorporating Asian elements. They wanted, uh, you know, uh, uh, European architecture. So. Uh, that's a different story, but that's a, a, a story worth pursuing. But thank you again, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.